Titans Rookie Mini Camp takes place from Friday, May 10th to Sunday, May 12th. If you're listening to this on Thursday, that's tomorrow. Brian Callahan, Will Levis, and a bunch of assistant coaches spoke to Titans Media on Thursday. We're going to talk about what we learned as well as a few other updates. This is the Music City Audible. Let's get to it. Oh, welcome everyone to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast. Happy Thursday. Happy Tyler Boyd signed with the Titans a couple days ago. Happy everything. Justin, how's it going? Doing well, man. A couple stuff we didn't get to cover over these last couple days. Our last episode, as, as our listeners and viewers are know, was the Tyler Boyd emergency reaction. So we'll talk a bit more about that now that we've got the official, you know, official contract number. We didn't have that when we did the emergency pod. A couple other signings and then some really interesting information we heard from the Callahan and assistant coaches press conference. Excited to get into that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to um, reminder this podcast is brought to you by Sinkers Beverages in East Nashville, Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville. If you've never been out to Sinkers Beverages in East Nashville, I highly recommend, especially if you're, you know, a drink connoisseur, if you like to dabble in some spirits or, or check out some beers, especially if you love beer, because they have a ginormous walk in beer fridge. I can see Justin saying I'm I'm a guy who loves beer. Um, so head out to Sinkers Beverages or check out the, the link in this podcast description or Sinkers Beverages and sign up for the in crowd in crowd members get access to allocated wines and spirits early access to barrel releases exclusive events and more so head over to sinkersbeverages.com all right justin let's get into these updates yes we're going to start with tyler boyd we broke down what it means for the titans offense how it raises the floor what his role is going to be but we didn't talk about how it impacts the salary cap it was a one-year deal worth up to, and this is key because as we record this on Thursday, we still don't have like the full breakdown. In fact, Brian Callahan said during his press conference on Thursday that the paperwork has not been signed, but he said it will be done shortly. No, no cause for concern. Hasn't been signed. By the way, just cut you right there. Sorry. Can you imagine, like, again, I don't care because I, you know, I I liked Mike Vrabel a lot, but you know where I'm going, right? Vrabel would have got up there and said, yeah, like he's not a Tennessee Titan yet. Like we, we're not going to talk about anyone. Whereas Callie got up there and said, Paperwork's not signed. I think he goes on to talk about how he fits in the locker room and he's a slot <laughs> receiver and all this. Like, just totally zero concern. I don't think Mike Vrabel would have given us that. I think Mike Vrabel would probably Mike Vrabel might have extended as far as you know, you know, good football player. We'd be honored to have him. Kind we'll of hope, thing. But we're hoping. No to, way he's we'll getting into happen. all those details. Oh yeah, not a chance. Um. So anyway, it's a one year one year deal worth up to four point five million dollars, and I think that's crucial there because it's probably like a three million dollar base salary with like playtime incentives maybe some statistical incentives but it's up to 4.5 million performance maybe you know you win a super bowl you get to the playoffs yada yada exactly but overall i mean this is a this is basically nothing this is like no money for them from the titans if you're talking about up to 4.5 million like what could the cap hit possibly be two three million dollars at most (laughs) it's a great deal for the titans and i want to be honest with you some, some of us are getting carried away I think Tyler Boyd at this point in his career is probably like a 500-yard receiver, maybe a 600-yard receiver. It's not a 1,000-yard receiver the Titans have added here, but neither here nor there. This is a great deal. I mean, look at look up the DJ Chark one. Didn't he get like $5 million from the Chargers? I, I, I haven't seen the paperwork of that one. I don't know if there was some built-in stuff, but I don't remember it saying up to $5 million. It seemed to say DJ Chark had signed four five million. I don't right. know about you. I'm taking Tyler Boyd over DJ Chark any day of the week. So if you're comparing that apples to apples, those contracts were essentially signed the same week. This is a huge victory for the Titans getting a much more productive proven uh, receiver in Tyler Boyd than what the Chargers got for more money. Yeah. And I think, you know, you call him a five to 600 yard receiver at this point in his career. I have him projected and well, I'm going to get way into these projections uh, uh, next week. Um, I think we'll do an episode next week where I talk about that. But I've got him projected for, you know, anywhere from six to eight hundred yards. And I think it's obviously it's going to depend on what kind of target share he commands um, and, and how effective the Titans are passing the ball, how pass heavy they are. But regardless, you, we talked a lot about this already on the emergency pod. So if you missed that, go check it out. But just, you know, ultimately raises the floor for what this Titans passing attack can be. Brian Callahan did say he's a slot. He will be your slot guy. Yeah. But he also said, and I want to transition here a little bit into some of our topics from Brian Callahan's press conference. He also said that this move was not about Traylon Burks, that this move doesn't really impact what, how they see Traylon Burks. And he said Traylon's going to play inside. He's going to play outside. He's going to learn how to play every receiver position that we have because that's how we're going to need him to contribute. This tells me, I think they probably see Traylon Burks as the backup X receiver, the backup Z receiver, 
and the backup F slot receiver. Like he's the backup to any, if anyone goes down, if anyone needs a breather, they're going to ask Traylon Burks to fill that role for a handful of snaps, a handful of games, whatever the, the situation may be when it comes to potential injuries and whatever, which I think, you know, we talked a little bit about this on the Boyd podcast, but getting more onto the Burks side, I think that's a great role for him. Take all the pressure off of Traylon Burks. Forget about the former first round pick. Forget about the you got to come in here and replace A.J. Brown's production. Now it's like you got to just take advantage of the opportunities you get. Make plays when you have the chance to make plays and just go have fun and play football. And I think that that's definitely going to help him. I do want to talk about with you here. I'll give you a chance to respond to that, but just to throw it out there so our audience knows. We should talk about the idea of potentially trading Traylon Burks. But anyway, your your thoughts on Traylon Burks in the wide receiver four role. Well. Well, I think the answer by by Coach Callahan is a little bit political, right? You're always going to say it, it doesn't, you know, it's got nothing to do with Traylon Burks. I, I think it's got a little to do with Traylon Burks, right? Like if you were super comfortable with him being the third best receiver on your roster, I don't know that you feel the need to go out and make this move. Granted, there, the price was right, as you said, the familiarity is there with Callahan, but it's got a little to do with Traylon Burks, I think. And, and I think regardless of this signing, he was probably going to be the backup X and, and Z Regardless, right? I think that's the role you had for him when you've got DeAndre Hopkins and Calvin Ridley on the team. In terms of the backup F, I still think there's a bit more competition there than maybe there is uh, elsewhere for him. Like uh, we talked about Kyle Phillips makes this team, what they see for Jaquan Jackson, Nick Westbrook Akine can play out there, yada, yada. I think there's a bit more competition there. Whereas if Hopkins or Ridley go down, and I know, you know, Westbrook Akine can play both those boundary spots as well. But if one of those starting guys goes down, I would like to think, you know, Burks is the first man up there. Yeah, I I agree with that. But it'll be interesting to see, you know, how he's utilized and if he's on the team, because there is a ton of speculation that Traylon Burks could now be moved. Now, I haven't seen anything that is actually credible. And I, in fact, I've seen the opposite i've seen dot connecting i've seen dot connecting that has turned into people picking up a report of dot connecting and turned it into multiple teams have expressed interest in trading Traylon burks and i saw a report that was like you know ari mayrov was like well the titans you know this may indicate that the titans are not super high on Traylon burks a guy that was drafted by the previous regime turned into the titans are out on burks as like an aggregated report and it's just like let's slow down with all that personally I don't think trading Traylon Burks is worth doing. Why? Like, why would you trade Traylon Burks at this point? Um, because what are you going to get for him? First of all, a sixth round pick, a seventh round conditional pick. Like, you're not going to get a lot for him. He's completely unproven. If anything, he's proven that he cannot stay on the field and contribute. And obviously, the the book's not closed on his career. But in terms of like what he's worth to other teams, like maybe someone sees a little bit of potential that they can unlock. But even if that's the case, they're not going to pay a high price for him. So what are you really getting? You have a deep talented receiver room for the first time in a very long time in Nashville. Like even when they had Corey Davis, AJ Brown, even when they had Julio Jones, AJ Brown, like they were never deep. They never had guys that you could rely on as your fourth or fifth wide receiver. Now they are deep. You want to give that up the minute that you get it just for what? So you can draft a a five foot eight slot receiver in the sixth round next year. Like what are you going to do with a sixth or seventh round pick that you might get in this trade? I'm totally out on trading Traylon Burks. And it's not because I I think he's a great receiver who's going to like live up to his first round potential. I just don't see the upside in trading him versus holding him. I get it. You're getting nothing for him back and you rather have the depth. And I fully agree with you. The reason I think a trade is still possible despite us agreeing on that, uh, I think people, when they think like this, they often remove the human being factor of it. I wouldn't shock me if the Titans said, you know what, let's give this kid a better shot at a fresh start. You know, it hasn't worked out here. We have a new regime. We're not the regime that brought this kid in initially. We obviously went out and got a bunch of guys. We went out to go get Calvin Ridley. We've gone out to get Tyler Boyd. We're building the offense that we believe in with the supporting cast that we brought in. Let's do right by the kid and give him a fresh start somewhere else, somewhere that might, you know, they'll never say this publicly, but somewhere that might have a little more faith in him than we do at this point. So I think that's the one caveat to that. Uh, There's two ways to make this decision. It's to say what we had agreed on. It's, you know, why would we, I'd rather have the depth than have a conditional seventh. And I fully agree. But the other side of that coin is the human being factor and saying, you know what, uh, this kid needs a fresh start. Let's just cut ties and, and give him a shot. 
Yeah, and I'm not ruling out the idea that they will trade him. I'm not saying, like, this is just how I feel about it. From my opinion is that they shouldn't. Um, if they get an offer for, like, a fifth-round pick for him or swap of six, like, and they feel like they're set at the receiver room and they're not going to, you know, there's too many, whatever, they're, they're doing the roster math and they're like, well, what are we going to keep seven receivers here? Like, I don't know if that necessarily makes sense. So I agree. I think that... Uh, I think there's definitely a chance he gets moved. I just, if I was running the team, it would have, they'd have to make it worth it. You got to give me like a fourth round pick to make it worth it. And there is no chance that Traylon Burks is fetching a fourth round pick. Let's talk about some other takeaways from Callahan's presser, from all these assistant coaches or anything else that you heard that you thought was particularly interesting. Just a couple of things. I think it was Paul Kuharski asked a really good question about how do you evaluate O-line when they're in t-shirt and shorts and pads are and on. And he just talked about the progress with technique. And I figured that's where he would go, but he said how he sees hand placement has been improving every single day. He says he's seen stances changing essentially day by day. That's Bill Callahan. I imagine getting his work on guys like Petit Friere and Jalen Duncan specifically, I would imagine. And so little things like that. I thought that was a really good answer. A couple of things I, I noted, and I think, I think Paul mentioned he was going to write an article on it. It caught my attention as well. I'm not going to write an article on it, but uh, he talked about how the, the director of performance, like strength coach is now speaking to the media as an extension of the assistant coaching staff. We've never seen that here. Like, did we ever hear from Frank Periani when he was here under Vrabel? I don't know that we did. So much, that's a huge change. I mean, we're not even at rookie minicamp here, and we already heard from the strength coach. I mean, that's really interesting to hear what he has to say. Give us a peek into that process. Probably one process on the team, even as fans, we get no peek into typically. So that was interesting, and I thought it was also interesting – Callahan, again, a little thing, but keeping with his theme of not being afraid to offer up information, talked about the exact number of steps like Traylon Burks took on practice yeah. on, on Thursday and even offering the speedy hit on the GPS monitor, like just little things that we're still getting used to here that are very, very different from the previous regime. Yeah, absolutely. I, I fully agree. Just the, you know, the openness that Brian Callahan has with the media. And this is very interesting because if you remember, we had Joe Goodberry on this podcast when the news was yeah. announced. And if you don't know Joe Goodberry, he does a fantastic job covering the Bengals. So he was very familiar with Callahan and his coaching style. And he told us then, like, Callahan will tell you what you want to know. Like, he's very yeah. open and honest and very candid. And it's super refreshing to have somebody like that. And just like, not only is it refreshing to have somebody like that in general, it is the polar opposite of the way Mike Vrabel was with information where he acted like, you know, they were the FBI protecting people's private information and like the national security was on the line if he let something slip there. So I love the hearing just like the honest candor from Brian Callahan and something else he talked about a little coach speaky here, but also cool to hear was uh, just Will Levis's development and growth. And he, he mentioned that Will Levis has really picked things up and and come in and, and been working really hard and shown improvement every day and been able to take what they talk about in the meeting rooms out to the practice field. And you just love hearing that about the young franchise quarterback that the team has invested so much in at this point, not necessarily in him, but in his success. And you talk about all the things they've added, the, the center, the left tackle, the wide receivers they've added around him, the running backs, like they, they are investing in Will Levis's success here. And you can tell that Brian Callahan is, you know, taking it personally that, you know, he wants to get Will Levis to that level. And Will Levis to that point talked about some quarterbacks that he's been asked to watch this off season to sort of like pick up on what, what Callahan's going to expect from him. He said, he's been watching uh, with Callahan together, been watching Joe Burrow, Matthew Stafford and Peyton Manning to kick off this install period. All so, guys he coached, right? Like all, all guys, guys Callahan that Callahan coached. coached, right? So Callahan is sitting there next to Will Levis watching this film together. It's one thing if you're a quarterback to go study somebody's tape, but to study the, some of the best of all time tape with the guy who coached them so that you can really say, what was the read here? What, why right. did he do it this way? Like those little things I think are going to be, they're going to pay huge dividends down right. the line. And the, the best thing about this was Will Levis said, I'm looking to be the next one. Like he <laughs> wants to be, when, when people talk about the list of great quarterbacks that Brian Callahan has coached, Will Levis wants his name to be on that list. And I think that, well, you know, that desire to be great is just going to serve him so well. There's no denying the drive. We're all familiar with that, right? Will Levis's approach and personality. But I think one of the interesting things is uh, I imagine, you know, Callahan, don't, 
as we said, it's not the first time he's seeing those plays. I bet you, as they're loading up those plays on the screen, he already knows and remembers what's coming. Like, that's the yeah. beauty of it, right? I mean, I, you know, he'd break down any quarterback's tape in the league, of course, but I think there's a little added layer of intrigue and, and value there that he's like, okay, yeah, this was a, like, I guarantee you, this was a second and 10 in the third quarter. He'll remember it verbatim. Yeah. And on that note of watching the, that tape, you know, especially when it comes to watching Joe Burrow's tape, like one of the guys he's watching Joe Burrow throw to is his new slot receiver, Tyler Boyd. <laughs> right. And Levis said he texted Boyd um, just to tell him that he was looking forward to learning the offense from him after watching him on tape and seeing the plays that he was making in this offense. Uh, he's looking forward to like having Tyler Boyd come in and help teach him the offense, which is exactly what we talked about on the emergency podcast was how Tyler Boyd's leadership and experience is going to come in here and filter down to everybody on the offense. And Levis also said he's been throwing with Calvin Ridley and developing chemistry there as well. So you, you just love to see, because sometimes, you know, you've seen, we've seen this in the NFL before, like sometimes a new receiver comes into an offense like Tyree kill to the dolphins and it just clicks immediately. And the quarterback takes off and AJ Brown and Philly. And like, we've seen it countless times, but other times we've seen a, a sort of an acclimation period where wide receiver and quarterback don't always get on the same page right away. And that can especially happen when like one of the two guys is hurt during training camp, but they're not getting the reps and whatever. So it's great to see that, you know, they're out there throwing, they're building that chemistry because they're going to need it with so many new weapons on that offense. Um, you know, it, Levis isn't going to be able to just rely on DeAndre Hopkins and he won't need to either because he has these other guys that he's already building chemistry with. So obviously this is like very typical offseason May talk. Everyone's getting way better. Every team feels really good about their chances to go to the to the playoffs. But even so, it's better than hearing some of the things we've heard in the past where it's like, well, Traylon Burks showed up to, to rookie minicamp out of shape and he can't stay out there because of right. his asthma. Like there are negative things you hear this time of year, too. So it's nice that we're not hearing any of those. <laughs> not yet. Rookie minicamp starts on Friday. So That's let's fair. see if Devondre <laughs> Sweat stays on the field for all of it. Right. <laughs> Pump the brakes. Honestly. <laughs> yeah, honestly, that's true. Um, anything else from Brian Callahan or Will Levis? I have some other things I want to get to, but from those two specifically. No, I think that that covers it, I'd say. So next, let's talk about Bill Callahan, because this is the first time Bill Callahan has spoken to the media. And some of the things he said were, were pretty interesting to me. Number one, talking about coming to coach with his son. And I know some people out there are a little tired of the father-son dynamic narrative that the media keeps pushing. But this was really interesting to me because Bill Callahan said, Brian was out there interviewing around this time last year. And if he had gotten a head coaching job last year, of course, I would have been proud of him. But... I wasn't, I don't think I would have gone with it. I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have gone to coach for him last year. But for whatever reason this year, I felt compelled to go help him, to go help him succeed in Tennessee. And uh, I think it's really cool that like timing wise, it worked out so well for the Titans because getting Bill Callahan, if you remember talking about why the Titans should hire Brian Callahan, we had all those conversations. One of our big points was that he will bring Bill Callahan. Like, obviously you're not hiring him just for that, but that's a huge plus to get a guy like Bill Callahan, who is such a good offensive line coach and come fix what has been the biggest weakness on a team for years. And I, I sort of joked with you before we started taping that this quote to me, like I felt compelled to go help him was like Bill <laughs> Callahan. You know, he was coaching in Cleveland last year. He watched Miles Garrett single handedly destroy yeah. the entire offense for the Titans because the offensive line was so bad. He was like, oh, my God, my son is going to fail if I don't go coach up that offensive line for him. <laughs> I, I mean, look, you know what? It's something I didn't expect to hear from him. It's really interesting that he said, you know, if he got the, if he got a job last year, I don't think it's something I would have been able to do. So really intriguing to hear how the timing just worked out so perfectly for the Titans on this front. And another thing Bill Callahan said that, you know, this is very expected, but still nice to hear is that he doesn't see any issues with J.C. Latham switching sides to left tackle. And we heard it, you know, from sources right after the draft that, uh, I think Diana, Diana Rossini was the one who said J.C. Latham was Bill Callahan's favorite player in the draft. And finally, on Friday tomorrow, they will have a chance to get on the field and work together. I'm very excited for that to play out. Yeah, one thing, by the way, that uh, Bill mentioned, uh, Coach Callahan, that I thought was interesting was uh, that when they drafted Jedrick Wills and they moved him from right to left, it was like a COVID year. So he goes, we didn't bring him in for a 30 visit. I didn't go and get to visit the school. Like just little things that he has had the opportunity to do with J.C. Latham uh, that he didn't get to do with Jedrick. And obviously we saw Jed hit the ground running with that switch, especially as a rookie. I just thought that was interesting. Maybe he didn't flat out come out and say it, 
but it certainly felt like what he was saying was, if anything, we're ahead of that process now because because you know the last one happened during the COVID year, which is an accurate thing to say. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And so um, he also talked a little bit about the right tackle situation. I encourage people to go find those clips on Twitter. I'm sure the Titans will post it to their YouTube page at some point today. But um, anything else? I think you know it was kind of interesting that. Uh, the Titans director of sports performance, newly hired Zach Woodfin, spoke to the media, which, you know, we, we hadn't heard a lot of t- times where the Titans were had a strength guy or a trainer come out and talk to the media. But um, and he talked, you know, he talked a little bit about just like assessing different players, what they need to reach their maximum performance using sports technology with like not just doing things. Not everyone's not the same. Everyone has an individual plan with how they, based on what testing and science they ha- data they have, how to implement the the to get the best performance out of them. It's sort of above my head stuff. You know, I don't really understand what he's talking about, but it sounds cool, and I appreciate that he shared it with the, with the media today. Well, this is the time of year for that, right? He said exactly what you're supposed to say. It's a time for assessment, and then they'll work with each player and get them on individual plans based on the results of that assessment. Yeah. All right. So anything else from these press conferences you want to cover? Yeah. One thing we forgot, I apologize. I wanted to lead with it and then it escaped my mind. Uh, Brian Callahan talking about uh, still adding a safety and an edge to this oh, roster. Right. Like, uh, yes. I think the safety we all see coming, that's going to happen at some point. But I don't know about you. Maybe I'm in the minority here. I wasn't as certain that they would still add an edge. Number one, there's not a lot out there still. To be honest, you know, I, I thought they we thought maybe they would draft one. They they didn't until the seventh round with Jalen Harold. Uh, there are a couple of veteran guys that make some sense for them. In fact, I think they'll add one of them at some point, but I wasn't certain that they were going to until he said it. You know, I, I started convincing yeah. myself and not, you know, they re-signed Marlon Davidson. That's something I'm gonna work into this. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a you guy that's got some that. inside outside versatility, can play as a big body coming off the edge, especially on early downs for them. So when they re-signed him, I started thinking that might be the move that they made at edge. And and all of a sudden you've got him that can play out there. They've got obviously Arden Key, who we love. They've got Rashad Weaver still. Maybe Sebastian Joseph Day can move out there on occasion. I started talking myself into that's probably going to be the rotation opposite Landry, that you're going to have Key, you're going to have uh, maybe a little bit of Davidson, a little bit of Weaver, maybe a little bit of Sebastian Joseph Day. And hey, those four guys will make up your snap uh, share at that position opposite Landry. So I wasn't thrilled with it because I think you can do better, but I was starting yeah. to think that's the way they're going to go. Well, now I'm like, no, they're going to add someone else, you know, whether that's a Carl Lawson, a Tyus Bowser, a, an Emmanuel Ogba, a Bud Dupree, you know, like I, I, yeah. I'm just starting to feel like they are going to add something here at, at some point over these next couple of days or weeks. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think that I mean, especially with the the comments from Callahan, especially talking about adding someone who can play physical. It sounds like they want an early down run stopping kind of yeah. of defensive end there. Somebody because we heard him call Arden Key a rotational edge rusher earlier this off season. And if you look at the depth chart right now, Arden Key ain't no rotational rusher. He is a your starting defensive yeah, he's end the, based by on the, far way the, depth the best chart. player you have at that position. Exactly, and he's a very good football player. Don't get us wrong. I just think you want to sort of manage that snap count a little bit better so he can do what he does best and that's pin his ears back and rush the quarterback when it comes right. to those situations that's what he's best at so if you're taking him off the field to help uh, keep him fresh for that who are you putting on the field right now it's a marlon davidson or a sebastian joseph they are rashad weaver and i think they can do better than that yeah and apparently so do they so they're gonna they're we'll expect a signing sometime in the next few days here maybe then the next week or so um and then the safety market you know we've been talking about this one for months because the for titans months. There was reported interest in Justin Simmons, former Broncos safety, second team all pro every each of the last three years, I do believe. Um, Marcus May was brought in for a visit and, you know, he has, you know, experience with Denard Wilson overlapping in uh, with the New York Jets. So there's there's been um, some connections to safeties there. And there's other guys available on the market as well. Uh, the former Texas Longhorn, Seattle Seahawks, Quandre Diggs out there, too. So there's there's still a num- number of guys and. Obviously, the Titans missed out. We haven't talked about this either. The Titans missed out on Andres Pete, went and signed with the Raiders. So we don't know if there's also going to be a move at tackle or not, um, but they but they will definitely be making a move, it seems like, at edge and at safety. Yeah, I agree. I, the tackle one, I, I think at this point, I, I would rank it 
least likely to happen. Right? Yeah. I think those two are definitely think... going to happen at edge and safety. And at tackle, you talk about missing out on Andres Pete. They brought him in for a visit. I, I know you're just using words, but maybe missing out is not even the right way. Right? Maybe like, they brought him in and we don't like him. You know what I mean? Yeah, like that true. happens too. <laughs> and it seems like, you know, the way they're talking about guys like Petit Friere, Duncan, Leroy Watson, it feels like they're focused on working with those guys at right tackle. Yeah. So at this point, I'm not convinced that there's going to be a veteran move at right tackle. And you know what? I don't think they need it. Like maybe I'm getting a little overconfident here. We've seen this, you know, we've seen this story I'm before. And... I'm a little concerned. <laughs> I'm, I'm not with you on that. I'll be, I'll say. I guess I just feel so good about left tackle, left guard, center from that side of the field, like from center out to the left. I feel so good about Latham, even though he's a rookie and he's transitioning positions. Like our viewers are in for a treat because we haven't even talked about this yet either. But next week we're gonna have a very extensive, thorough film breakdown with J.C. Latham's high school coach. Uh, Kevin Wright, who coached at IMG Academy and then went on to coach tight ends at Indiana. Extremely smart guy. Really helped us break down J.C. Latham film to a level that I didn't think you and I could get to. Um, But having done that, you know, that I just have so much confidence in J.C. Latham's ability to come in and be a high level day one starter on that left side, especially it's not just because of Latham. It's also because of Bill Callahan, you know, so I have a lot of faith in that. Peter Skaronsky putting the weight back on that he lost from his appendectomy. I mean, he had his best game of the year, week 18 against Jacksonville last year. I, I have full confidence that he could play at a potentially an all-pro level. I'm not saying he'll be an all-pro, but at that level. And then Lloyd Cushenberry at the center spot. I mean, what a massive upgrade you're talking about here from Aaron Brewer, who was a point of weakness, and not just like physical weakness in terms of not being as strong uh, because he's a smaller undersized guy, but one of the weakest links on your line, I mean, your only good lineman last year was basically Skaronsky and then Brunskill by default because the rest of the line was so bad that putting in the center position is such an important position on the offensive line. Like you oftentimes you want your best offensive lineman to be at your, at the center spot because they got to call out the protections. They got to get everybody else lined up and know what they're doing. And then they, they got to be able to snap the ball block run block. I mean, there's so much going on at the center spot that is cerebral. In addition to physical that you need a great, but look at Jason Kelsey and how good those Eagles offensive lines have been with, you know, a future hall of fame center. Not that Lloyd Cushenberry is Jason Kelsey, but he's a, a top, what three five center in the nfl so because i feel so good about the center to left tackle spot i'm okay with like if they trot out daniel brunskill at right guard that's fine you know having a much better player to his left than aaron brewer he's gonna be i'm not at convinced it's level. gonna be brunskill sorry not to cut you off and i'm not either i'm not like, i'm not either this might be like a wide i think open it could competition. be it might be Saudi charles it, it might, might be, be uh Reyes. it might be the undrafted free agent out of texas tech What's his name? I don't. I don't. Wouldn't go that far. No, Cole Spencer. You're talking. No, Cole Spencer. I, I, th- I think it's going to be one of those three. It'll be Brunskill, Radins, or Sadi Charles. Like Bill mm-hmm. Callahan had some really good things to say about Charles the other day. I don't know if you heard that, but uh... you want to make a bet here? <laughs> oh, are we? What's What's the bet? Cole Spencer starts at least one game at right guard this year. Okay, well, if there's an injury, that's that's a different ball game, right? But like, <laughs> he ain't winning the starting job coming out of camp. There's no way in hell. I don't think he, I don't think that. No, no, I don't think that. But I think he starts one game this year, at least, maybe more. We'll so see. Tempted to make what's the what's the bet? What's the terms of the bet? I'm no, I don't know. Gentleman's wager here. <laughs> a gentleman's <laughs> wager. It is. <laughs> All right, there you go. I have nothing to lose because whatever, who cares? I, I, I think I just I'm, I'm really interested. I think there might be more of a battle there than we think. You know that that's interesting to me. Uh, that you talked about the co- comments. He had a lot of good things to say about Saudi Charles. Bill Callahan did. He yeah, said very he did, impressed yeah. with his career in Washington and feels like a guy that really fits our scheme. So part of me wonders now if that was a Bill Callahan signing. Yeah, no doubt about it. And then the uh, the guy they brought over from, or the guy they traded for from Cleveland also, Leroy Bill Callahan's Watson, obviously yeah. worked with him, Leroy Watson. So you, you got plenty of, I guess that's why I'm saying I'm not concerned. Like, it's not that I'm not concerned with who wins the job. It's just that I don't think they need to sign somebody. They brought in I'm, I'm Charles, they brought in I, Watson. I, I, I think there's a possibility that that right side could still be a liability, the whole right side. So I'm a little bit concerned, but neither here nor there. I, I love what they've done from left tackle to center. I agree. And maybe you could only get so much new on that O-line in one off season. Right. So I, I right. think they're going to make more, we'll see more moves next year, I think to get even better, but uh, certainly I, I love what they have from, from left to center. Yeah, I, I agree. So anything else that came out of these updates, you want to talk very briefly about what to expect from rookie minicamp or maybe not what to expect, but what to watch for. I think you yeah. called out one of them already. 
and that is Tavandre Sweat. How does he show up weight-wise, conditioning-wise? Yeah. What are the reports on him coming out? That is the number one thing number that one. I am interested in. Number one for me, by far. I mean, that's like you said, I mean, hopefully we get some good reports and some maybe some clips. I don't know how the schedule is going to work, but I thought Frank Bush had a really funny quote. They asked about Cedric Gray Gray wearing the green dot. And he said, "Uh, can I get him here first? Like before I put a dot on him, like, let me see, let me, let me coach him before I I know what he is for us. But um, I thought it was funny. So those are the things to watch. So let's hear whether glowing or not, or negative or lackluster, like the reports, the clips, we're going to get some good stuff over these next couple of days. And I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I'm totally looking forward to it as well. I'm excited to see, you know, what kind of return games going on. And then the UDFAs and and the tryout guys, like just what that competition level is like. Those are things I'm going to be watching for. Obviously, the comfort level with JC Latham moving back to the left side. If we get any note of, note of um, any reporting on how he's doing out there, obviously, you know, there's it's going to be no minimal or no contact. Are they is there contact a lot of rookie? Minicamp? I, don't, I don't think there is. Even Coach Callahan is, talked about he's going to come here and learn different angles, footwork, pass sets like it is different on the left. You're putting different hand down and all that. So uh, it, it will be interesting to follow along. Hopefully we get some reports out of JC's progress there at left tackle. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then, I mean, that, that's kind of the extent that those guys mostly are who I'm paying attention to. You mentioned Cedric Gray. So those three guys, the guys that we expect to be day one starters for this team, yeah. um, really going to closely follow how they do. And then, you know, the UDFA running backs, which guys make look the most explosive. Again, no contact. You're not going to see them running through tackle. So it's hard to really get a gauge of it. But it'll just be interesting to see the reports of who's standing out, who's shining here at rookie minicamp. Um, all right, Justin, anything else you want to cover here in this update episode before we get out? That does it for this episode. Uh, we wanted to cover the presser stuff. Quick little episode for you guys. As Graver teased, I wasn't going to give it away. Graver's more, Gra- well, I'm more of I'm a gonna, tease than Graver is. But I'm going to give the schedule out for next week here just because a little just, bit of a... Why, why don't you give them what we're hitting on the GPS monitor while you're at it? Just give them <laughs> everything we've got. I'm trying to be more like Brian Callahan, less like Mike Vrabel here, okay? I'm not keeping uh, I, things I'm a bit close old. I got the Mike Vrabel, Jeff Fisher in me. I wasn't <laughs> going to give it to him. I was going to let it hit their feeds on Monday, and hopefully they all, everyone goes, wow, I can't believe that they, they've done this for us. But go ahead. Well, here's the reason for it is because I'm going out of town. From Monday to Friday, I'm going to be out of town. So we're not going to be back early next week to recap our rookie minicamp takeaways or anything like that, which is a bummer, but we'll get to it when we get to it. Not not to worry, everyone. We will cover it eventually. But in the meantime, while we're out, we've pre-recorded a, a few videos here. And um, one of those being a very, uh, like I just mentioned, a very intense film session breakdown with IMG, former IMG head coach, uh, Kevin Wright, where we look at JC Latham in the SEC championship game. Really outstanding film breakdown. So I, I encourage everyone to check that out when it drops on Monday. And then on Thursday, going to have a video where I project the 2024 offense for the Titans. And this is super in-depth, super calculated, a lot of math involved here. I'm looking at, you know, indicators that lead to how to project an offense. I'm not just saying like, oh, well, Will Levis, uh, he should throw for, I don't know, 4,500 yards. Like, it's like based on how many plays per game the Titans are going to pro- be projected at, what the pass run split's going to be, completion percentage, yards per attempt, guys, yards per reception, guys, catch rate, touchdown percentage. Like, there is a lot of math that goes into this, so I'm really excited to reveal this to everybody. I'm looking at it on three levels, what I call the conservative projection, what I call the aggressive projection, which is like if everything goes perfectly. Best case and then scenario. what I'm... Yeah, best case scenario. And then what I'm calling the realistic projection. So we're going to go through those in a video next week. And then if anything happens, if they sign a safety or an edge rusher, hopefully you and I can find five or 10 minutes to hop on and and, and react to it because I am, you know, I'm not going to be here. So that'll be tough, but we'll see. <laughs> you guys have been loving the emergency pod. So we'll do our best if they sign someone. Um, look, not a lot of, I mean, not to pat ourselves on the back, but not a lot of pods are, are going off for a week here as Graver's going to be on vacation. And we're going to hit you with an hour long film breakdown with a freaking college head coach and or a college coach and a high school head coach that coached JC Latham in high school. It's literally the best high school program in the entire country. Coach Wright sat down with us for more than an hour. If you're not familiar, IMG Academy, they've had five straight drafts, a first round pick. They had two this year because JJ McCarthy, the quarterback out of Michigan, also went to IMG. Evan Neal, I know he hasn't lived up. He went to IMG uh, for a long time there with Coach Kevin Wright. So this is a really, really special break. Now, honestly, I think, Braver, I'm not going on a limb, uh, potentially the the best thing you and I have ever done. The best thing you and I have ever done that will see the light of day, because I still think the best thing you and I ever did was the Roger Saffold 
film breakdown uh, we with Roger drop that one. I mean, it's a different playbook. The <laughs> Titans wouldn't care. I, I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you've ever said this on air. We probably have. Graver and I sat down with Roger Saffold for like an hour long breakdown of the New England Patriots playoff win where the Titans go into Foxborough and Derrick Henry runs for 200 something yards. Roger Saffold sat down with Graver and I and broke down the entire all 22. And then I think the NFL shut it down or something along those lines. I can't remember what it was, but. Yeah, from an earlier tape with a Titan we did, we got a cease and desist, and then so we I abandoned the edit. On, I never edited it. I mean, it would take me hours just to edit that, so I don't think we ever will drop it, you know? Yeah. But, you uh, still have it, it though. It's good to know you still have I, it. I still have the footage somewhere. Um, all right, that'll do it. So we've been rambling for like five minutes. Let's get out of here, Justin. Uh, very excited about what's to come next week. Very excited for Rookie Minicamp. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. We appreciate all of you watching on YouTube. Make sure you are subscribed to the Music City Audible podcast. Give this video a like, a thumbs up, like, and uh, turn on alerts for the channel so you get a notification every time we drop a new video. You don't want to miss Monday's video drop, so make sure you got those alerts turned on. And thanks to Sinkers Beverages in East Nashville, Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville. Mentioned it at the top, but you got a huge huge selection of bourbon, wine, spirits, liquor, alcohol, every every possible type of alcohol, which I just said spirits, liquor, alcohol. <laughs> Those are the same thing. Um, but so much to choose from if you head over to Sinkers Beverages or Bluegrass Beverages. And if you check out sinkersbeverages.com or find the link in this podcast description, you can join the in crowd. In crowd members get access to allocated wines and spirits, exclusive events, early access to barrel releases, and more. So head over to sinkersbeverages.com today. All right, Justin, that'll do it for us. Appreciate all of you out there. Until Monday, y'all stay safe out there. Until Monday or an emergency pod b- b- breaking news like tomorrow. Um, until then, y'all stay safe out there and tighten up. A Broadway Sports Media Production.